Hello my dears, if you are new to seeing my face, hi, my name is Sydney Zerlingo, my favorite color is Buttercup Yellow, I'm autistic, disabled, gay and a college student, and I make educational videos about all of that, as well as fun vlogs with occasional goose content. I'm also a musician, and yesterday I released my very first music video, which you should totally watch, it's in the, over here, I know where it is now, it's over here, and the link is also in the description, and you should definitely check it out. Today is a bit different from my normal educational stuff because we're going to talk about my autism story. The thing with late diagnosis is that you have to figure out yourself that you're autistic rather than a parent figuring it out when you're a toddler. So I'm going to share my story and what I learned through my diagnosis saga and hopefully it can help some other people. Or if it doesn't, I had fun making this and finding old pictures of myself, so either way I am content. Anyway, as you may remember from my What is Autism video, autism is innate at birth. So this little potato over here is autistic, even though no one knew. I was working on a project this fall where I had to go through a lot of old home videos from when I was a kid, and I discovered that I was always really, really stimmy and flappy. We have videos of me deep in special interest, overwhelmed and semi-verbal, etc. Though I might add that hindsight is 2020, and if you weren't looking for autistic traits in the moment, you wouldn't see them as atypical. What I find most interesting is around the age of three or four, my use of eye contact mostly stops, and I also stop stimming. That's the age range where kids start to understand social constructs, such as gender, so my theory is that I realized stimming wasn't a thing other kids did, so I stopped, which then took away my ability to emotionally regulate so I could no longer make eye contact. Over the years, my masking skills clearly grow to a point where it seems like I'm making normal eye contact, acting typically, but I also got progressively more bland as that level of masking grew, and my mental and physical health got progressively worse. <laughs> At age 8, I was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder and OCD, and I had my first migraine, and things just kind of went downhill from there. So, growing up in school, I always knew that I was different. Not in the way that a celebrity on a talk show is like, oh, I always knew I was special, but like, I never felt quite comfortable in my own skin. I was known in school as the smart girl, and I thought I had a lot of friends, but it turns out they just wanted me to help them with their work, and they didn't want to play. I was always nice to everyone, and was doing all the things right, so I didn't understand why I never had any close friends, or why I was being bullied all the time. Also, learning-wise, school is never really the right speed or level for me. My solution was to switch schools for high school, because that must have been the issue. Going somewhere else would fix it. And it didn't fix it, but it did make things a heck of a lot more clear. The summer before I started on my new school, one of my summer reading books was The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. You know, the book from the point of view of an autistic kid? This was the first book I'd read from an autistic person's point of view that I knew was autistic. I should add that growing up my favorite book was Anne of Green Gables, when I kind of saw myself as her, and now I have a slight Canadian accent sometimes because I watch the movie too much, but I didn't know at the time that she was textbook autism, so that's irrelevant. Back to the story. Um, I was at a summer camp when I read this book, and I remember sitting on my bunk in cabin 5 and just crying when I finished the book. And my friend was like, why are you crying? And I told her that I was sad because the book was over because I'd never read a book like that before. And that night I didn't sleep because I was still trying to figure out why that book had that much of an effect on me. And by the morning I realized that it was because it was the first time I'd fully seen myself in a book. But that didn't make sense because I'm not autistic, so that's weird. But then I started to wonder, so I grabbed a notebook and a magic marker and I made a list of all the things Christopher, the main character, did that I did too, and I came up with over a hundred things, so that was alarming. And I showed it to my cabin mates and they all tried to convince me out of it, so I crumpled up the list and I threw it out and I tried to forget about the whole thing, and then the next day I had my first migraine bad enough that I couldn't walk and I spent the day in the infirmary. Throughout my first year at my new school, this whole autism situation simmered in the back of my mind. The next summer, I had my first experience with depression, which was not fun, and the autism thing still just ate away at me. And around halfway through sophomore year, I had to put that on hold to deal with the whole am I gay situation, um, an existential crisis that resulted in three weeks of my life being entirely panic attacks and migraines and depression, so that wasn't fun. But anyway, I came out as bi in May of that year, which made things a little bit better. I came out as lesbian only a year and a half ago, by the way, so I am gay gay. Um, but in mid-crisis, I decided therapy was a good idea. And when I mentioned the autism thing to that therapist, she told me point blank that I wasn't autistic, and that girls don't really have autism, so I was fine and I shouldn't worry about it. But that did not make me feel any better, so I hoped that if I ignored the situation, it would just go away. Yeah. A year later, I had a huge meltdown in India, of all places, and that brought up the question yet again in my mind, and this time it wouldn't go away. 
And then a few months later, someone close to me got diagnosed with autism and ADHD at age 21. And up until then, I'd always thought the diagnoses were something that somebody referred you to. I didn't know that you could just go and do it on your own. So I watched her reading books about autism and starting to feel comfortable in her own skin and I wanted that so badly. So I managed to convince my mom to make me an appointment and I did a full day and a half of various tests. And then when I met with a psychologist after it all, he told me I didn't meet all of the diagnostic criteria. For those under the age of 18, traits need to be noticed by a close person such as a parent, kids' teachers, and the person themselves. And since I did it in the summer and couldn't ask my teachers, he went off of my report card with straight A's and a lot of Sydney's a pleasure to have in class and no Sydney had panic attacks in my class and therefore taught herself pre-calc while sitting under a table in the back of the room. He said my socialization was normal enough and I left feeling crushed and confused. I had an ADHD diagnosis but that wasn't what I needed. I needed somebody to tell me that I was normal. And when I broke down about it I was told that I shouldn't need a doctor or a label to tell me that I was normal and I should just know that for myself. But I didn't just know that for myself. I'd spent 16 years feeling wrong and lost and broken and I wanted somebody to tell me that it wasn't because I was defective, I was just a different kind of person. That was literally all I needed. So when I went to college a year and a half later, I just called myself autistic. I stimmed openly every now and then, but in general I felt like a fraud. I knew the label fit, but I kept doubting myself. If I'd done more research into the autistic community at the time, I would have learned that self-diagnosis is fully valid, but in my head, without a diagnosis, I had no right to read the books or watch the movies or take up space in social media as an autistic person. I told myself I was unmasking and being authentically me, but I spent 17 years masking and I had no idea how to be the real me or who the real me was. So I made a bunch of friends and chameleon to them and I was happy and they empowered me to go and try to get a diagnosis for real. So over winter break of that year, I went to a new psych group and told myself not to mask at all. I refused eye contact, I openly stimmed the entire time just to make a point and I tried to embody the absolute stereotype of autism. I had to be sure that I would have the diagnosis by the end of it. A quarter of the way through my testing, the doctor brought in an autism specialist who I talked to about Russian history for a bit, and then I heard her in the hallway talking to my doctor saying, I don't get what the mystery is, she's clearly autistic. I left that day with a big manila envelope that had a paper inside saying I had autism, and I thought that was it. The hard part was over. I knew who I was, and that was it. Turns out I was very wrong, because uh, the thing about getting a late diagnosis is that you relive every single moment of your life through a new lens at the same time you're living your present life. And it's exhausting, and it brings up a lot of traumatic memories, and I realized that the amount of over-the-top autistic things that I did at the doctor's office was actually the most comfortable I'd ever been. So when I went back to school for the spring, I tried to be that girl from the doctor's office, and all my friends didn't know what to do with that. Then we have a blurry three-ish months of my life that were a physical and mental health train wreck, which is a story that I'm still not quite ready to tell. I will be doing so in a month-ish uh, for a music video. So, yep, for now, just know that it was a hot mess. But I learned from that, and I came to school this semester being 100% myself. You can find me walking around campus in the floofiest of skirts, happily flapping my hands and eating the same thing for every meal. And since I've been so openly and honestly me and stopped masking, I've made lots of friends. And not just friends I chameleon to, but solid good friends who like me for me. And that's why diagnoses are important. I always knew I was weird and didn't fit in, but having that label gave me something to hold on to and a way to understand why I didn't quite fit. And it gave me the opportunity to learn about my differences and find ways to work with them and make life more livable. And I know that I'm lucky that I was able to get tested twice because so many people can't even get tested at all. And I'm lucky to have known this stuff in my teen years rather than in my 40s like so many other late diagnosed people. But I can't help but wonder what my life path would have looked like if I'd known when I was two or when I was eight or when I was 12. Yikes, that's a photo. But anyway, I'm proud to be autistic. I fought for this label and I wear it proudly. Yeah, it has some struggles to go with it, but I was always autistic. And without the label, I just felt lost and confused. The label gave me the knowledge to understand myself and learn to deal with my struggles and find a community of people like me and most importantly, be who I truly am. Anyway, thank you for watching this and listening to this part of my life story. I've provided my favorite books and resources for my journey in the description below and I welcome you to use them. As always, I hope you learned something and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.